The man known to history as Amon Goethe was born as Amon Leopold Goethe on the 11th of December 1908 in Vienna, which at the time was the capital of the vast Austro-Hungarian Empire. His father was Amon Franz Goethe, the owner of the Viennese publishing house Verlag Anstalt Amon Franz Goethe. The company specialized in military books, but also sold religious publications and postcards. It did quite well, and as a result, the younger Amon was born into an upper-middle-class family of the Vienna business community. Amon's mother was Bertha Schwent Goethe. He was the couple's only child, and as such, he could look forward to a comfortable life given his family's prosperity. Young Amon was afforded a good education for the time. He was sent to an upper-middle-class Catholic school in Vienna, and would eventually attend the Weidhoven an der Tyre College, close to what today is the Czech border. This was an agricultural college, which Goethe began attending when he was still in his mid-teens. But despite the affluence of the Goethe family, Amon's childhood was troubled in its own way. Amon Franz Goethe often traveled for his work, sometimes very widely, in an effort to open up new markets for the publishing houses' books and other printed material. Back in Vienna, the day-to-day -day labor of actually managing the office and its employees consequently fell to Beata Goethe, and so, with both his father and mother largely indisposed, Amon was largely raised by his aunt. This combined with being an only child left him somewhat isolated, but also resentful of his parents. Thus, the beginnings of the bitter, savage man that would later emerge were already making themselves felt when Amon was just a teenager. Years later, he would reflect on this to his mistress in Poland, Ruth Irena Kalda, who noted in an interview in 1975 that Amon felt as though his parents had neglected him. We are fortunate to know extensive details about Goethe's earlier life, not because he kept a diary or composed a memoir, such as is the case with some other senior Nazis such as Joseph Goebbels and Albert Speer, but because there is an extensive file on Goethe in the Bundesarchiv Berlin Documentation Center. This was compiled by the Schutzstaffel or SS, the Nazi Party paramilitary organization which Goethe would subsequently join, and includes statements by Goethe himself about his youth and early adult years. Supplementing this are the extensive details about Goethe's wartime record and war crimes, which was produced as part of his trial after the conflict and which gives further extensive details on his actions in the 1930s and 1940s. This contains first-hand accounts by some of those who witnessed Goethe's actions during the Second World War. And all of this is supplemented by accounts by individuals who would eventually escape from the concentration camp in Poland which Goethe ended up commanding. Furthermore, the interview which his former mistress, Ruth Irena Kalder gave in 1975 to the Israeli historian Tom Segev is a very useful personal account of Goethe's views, although probably biased in many respects. As a consequence, we are able to develop a more detailed picture of Goethe's life and actions during the war than we otherwise would be able to for a good many of the other commandants of the concentration camps. Goethe's childhood years were spent in a country which was mired in war. For years, the major European powers had been aligning themselves into two armed camps, driven by a wide range of forces, including colonial rivalry, regional conflicts in areas such as the Balkans, and rivalry particularly between Britain and Germany. The Empire of Austria-Hungary in which Goethe was born and grew up was mainly concerned in this maelstrom with the Balkans, where it was vying with Tsarist Russia for influence as the Ottoman Empire collapsed. However, the government in Vienna was also concerned about the increasing nationalist movements amongst people such as the Croats and Serbs. In the summer of 1914, a Serb nationalist assassinated the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and the crisis which ensued in the weeks that followed eventually spiralled into a European-wide war between Germany and Austria-Hungary on one side and Britain, France and Russia on the other. Eventually others would involve themselves until it became a global conflict. The First World War would last until 1918, with Britain and France finally emerging as the main victors. At its conclusion, the German Empire collapsed, and a new republic named after the town of Weimar was created 
while the Austro-Hungarian Empire was dismembered, with major regions such as Hungary and Czechoslovakia acquiring their independence from a new, smaller state of Austria. Gerd began to rebel against his social and familial background in his late teens. He would later claim that he did so in order to turn his back on the bourgeois social values which his parents had tried to instill in him. They wished for Amon to be educated in a way that would prepare him for taking over the publishing business one day. But although Amon was clearly an intelligent student, he showed little commitment to his work and eventually dropped out of the agricultural college he attended at Weidhoven after just a few months. Rather, Goethe was more interested in athletics and physical activity, and, more concerning, was an interest he had developed in politics during his few months in college. In 1925, when he was still just 17 years of age, he joined the youth chapter of the Austrian branch of the National Socialist Workers' Party, a pan-Germanic party which had been established in Germany in the aftermath of the First World War. The Nazi party, as it was commonly known, was committed to the idea of reversing the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which had ended the war, creating a strong Greater Germany, and fighting against the perceived influences of the Jewish people and communists in Germany and surrounding nations. Headed by a fellow Austrian called Adolf Hitler, they had attempted a military insurgency in Munich in November 1923, and were thereafter regarded as an extremist party in both Germany and Austria. Goethe had been drawn to the Nazi party for a number of reasons. Many Austrians were interested in Nazism owing to its insistence that the peace terms offered to Germany and Austria in the aftermath of the First World War were overly punitive. And most historians today agree that the treaty terms were indeed overly harsh and created severe economic problems in these countries. But Goethe, with his interest in sport and athletics, was also attracted by the party's emphasis on the physicality of the German people and their martial and sporting prowess. Its associations, such as the youth branch of the party, also fostered camaraderie, and for an individual who had been raised as an only child and had distant parents, the Nazi party perhaps offered the promise of some companionship. But if these were some of the more benign things which attracted Goethe, there were also less positive aspects to his liking of the party. He was openly anti-Semitic and possessed of racial hatred towards the Jewish people. This was made clear in 1927 when, while having returned to Vienna to work in his parents' publishing house, he joined the Styrian Home Protection Organization, a rabidly anti-Semitic branch of the Austrian Home Guard, another fascist group operating in the country at the time. Goethe continued to work for some time with his parents in Vienna, but without undergoing the sort of academic training which would have prepared him to succeed his father as head of the firm one day, it was clear he viewed his position there at the time as a temporary employment, which he would possibly move on from. It was in Vienna in 1930 that he became caught up in a power struggle within Austrian fascism. Following the Wall Street crash in 1929 and the Great Depression which followed it, the Nazis had moved from being a fringe party with the support of little more than 5% of the German people to quickly becoming a major force in German politics. As they did, the Austrian branch of the party sought to consolidate its hold over Austrian fascism by forcing the Austrian Home Guard and other groups to merge with them. This did not succeed, and the Nazis now decreed that Austrian members could not also be members of the Home Guard. Goethe was aligned with both, but tied his flag to the Nazi party after some deliberation. Accordingly, in May 1931, Goethe, who until this time had remained a member only of the youth wing of the Nazis, became a full member, number 510,764. This would later qualify him as an old fighter, a party member who had joined before January 1932. Once he had become a fully-fledged member of the party, Goethe's involvement in its various branches and organizations became more extensive. For instance, he had become a member of the SA, the Sturmabteilung or Brown Shirts, a paramilitary wing of the party which wore brown shirts as their military uniform. Members participated in military drills and parades as part of Nazi militaristic activity. And it was possible through his initial involvement with the SA 
that Goethe developed an interest in the more hardline branch of the Nazis, the Schutzstaffel or SS, meaning Protection Squad, which was, like the SA, a paramilitary grouping within the Nazi party. It was originally established as a small bodyguard unit for Hitler. However, unlike the SA, the SS placed an overt emphasis on the racial ideology of the Nazis, particularly so after Heinrich Himmler became the new head of the organization in 1929. Himmler's appointment also saw a massive increase in the size of the SS, from just hundreds of men to thousands and eventually tens of thousands. Goethe had seemingly applied to become a member of the SS in 1930, but his application was only accepted in 1932 when he became the 43,673rd member of the organization. It would be a fateful association, as the SS would in time become the body which orchestrated the worst of the Nazis' war crimes across Europe. 1933 was a significant year for both Goethe and the Nazi movement overall. As the economic situation had deteriorated in Germany in 1931 and 1932, the Nazis had risen to become a major force in German politics. Elections to the Reichstag in 1932 confirmed them to be the leading party in the country, while still only able to command just over one-third of the vote. The communists, regarded as their ideological opponents, were the second strongest performing party, and so Germany was now engaged in a tussle between the right-wing Nazis and the left-wing communists. Eventually, the Nazis won out, as the center-right-leaning business community in Germany decided to back Hitler early in 1933. He became chancellor, and within weeks, a dictatorship was established through an enabling act which allowed the Nazis to rule by decree. For Goethe in Austria, the implications of this centered on the response of the Austrian government. It was concerned by the rise of the Nazis and the party's call for a greater Germany. Consequently, in 1933, it began cracking down on the Nazi movement in the country and eventually prohibited the party entirely on the 19th of June 1933. Goethe, who was already being sought for engaging in terrorist activities around Vienna on behalf of the party, fled Austria and relocated to Germany later in the year. Goethe now followed the exodus of senior members of the Austrian Nazi party, who were streaming north over the Austrian border with Germany towards Bavaria and the city of Munich, where Hitler and the main leaders of the German Nazi party had risen to prominence a decade earlier, and he quickly established himself here within a sort of Austrian Nazi party in exile, one which sought to continue to disseminate the Nazi message throughout Austria from southern Germany. Goethe's specific involvement was trying to use the new medium of radio to broadcast Nazi programs and messages over the airwaves which could be picked up on in Austria. And he was also working during this time as a courier for the SS, moving between Germany clandestinely over the Austrian border. It was this activity which led to him being arrested in October 1933, as the Austrian government of Chancellor Engelbert Dolfus was trying to purge Austrian society of its Nazi element, a campaign which saw some 50,000 Austrian Nazis incarcerated by April 1934. Goethe was not among them though, as he was released in the final days of 1933 owing to a lack of evidence and returned to Germany. Our understanding of Goethe's activities in the months and years that followed is aided by the interview Goethe's mistress Ruth Irene Kalder gave in 1975. She noted how Amon continued his activities with the Austrian Nazi party in exile following his return to Germany but his brief arrest and imprisonment late in 1933 did not deter him from making further forays over the border into Austria in 1934, as the politics of his home country was becoming increasingly turbulent. In an effort to suppress the Nazis, Chancellor Dollfuss increasingly cemented a brand of Austro-Fascism distinct from that of the Nazis, and after an attempted uprising by the Nazis in February 1934, he established a new constitution which gave himself near dictatorial powers. However, he would not live long to exercise them. On the 25th of July, 1934, Dolphus was assassinated by a squad of nearly a dozen Austrian Nazis in the Chancellery building in Vienna. And it seems clear that Goethe had played a part in the planning of the assassination. Moreover, he was one of several thousand Austrian Nazis who were detained in the country in the weeks that followed 
but somehow he managed to escape from custody and yet again fled over the border to safety in southern Germany. It was a near escape, one which might have otherwise led to a lengthy jail sentence or even his execution. In the aftermath of the failed Nazi coups in Austria in the spring and summer of 1934, a new government emerged there under Kurt Schuschnigg, which maintained Dollfuss's anti-Nazi stance with greater success in the mid-1930s. As a result, many of those Austrian Nazis who had been attempting to seize power in Austria by operating from Germany resigned themselves to the fact that this would not be possible for some time. Accordingly, from late 1934, Goethe began to focus on advancing within the ranks of the SS in Germany by finding a position at Dachau concentration camp, which had recently been established in Bavaria to detain political prisoners. However, he temporarily left the organization just a few months later when he fell out with his immediate commander, Alfred Bigler. This was a time during which the Austrian members of the SS declined quite considerably, following the failure to establish control over their native land. Consequently, in the mid-1930s, Goethe turned for some time to working for his family's publishing business to handle its activities in Germany. He also married shortly after settling fully in Germany to Olga Janoschek, a woman who was recommended to Goethe by his parents who knew her family. But the marriage was immediately troubled and they divorced within just a few months. Amon's years in exile from Austria in Germany in the mid-1930s coincided with a period during which the Nazi state was becoming increasingly belligerent on the European stage. It had always been the intention of Hitler and his followers to overturn the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Accordingly, from their first seizure of power in 1933, a gradual rearmament began throughout Germany. Then, in March 1936, the Rhineland region was remilitarized. Under the terms of Versailles, this region was to remain strictly empty of German armed forces in order to prevent any future build-up of power along the French border and the border with the Low Countries. The Allied powers, though, were willing to appease Hitler in this respect as the area had been demilitarized for nearly 20 years. Yet it was also the first sign of a strategy of appeasement by Britain and France which was to prove catastrophic in the years that followed. Additionally, a new German air force called the Luftwaffe had been established under the command of Hermann Goering. This new found belligerence and rearmament spoke of a willingness by Hitler and the Nazis in Germany to increasingly confront its neighbors and the main victors of the First World War, Britain and France. This would soon have consequences for Austria and for Goethe. Goethe was relatively inactive between his moving away from the SS between late 1934 and early 1937, as he largely continued working for his parents' company from within Germany. First signs that he had returned to being an active Nazi and SS member came in the summer of 1937, when he wrote a letter to the headquarters of the Austrian Refugee Society, in which he requested the transfer of his Nazi Party membership number from Austria to Munich. The timing of this is significant. Throughout 1937, political pressure was again being employed by the Nazis to try to bring Austria under its control. By the summer of that year, Hitler was determined to annex Austria and was offering renewed support to a resurgent Austrian Nazi movement. In response, Kurt Schuschnigg's government in Vienna tried to crack down again on these initiatives by mass arrests of Austrian Nazis, but this had a limited effect. Accordingly, on the 9th of March 1938, he called a referendum on the issue of unification with Germany, hoping that a victory in this vote would shore up support for the government. But what the result might have been in a fair election is difficult to determine. Before it could ever be held, Hitler ordered the German 8th Army to cross the border into Austria. Under the German occupation, the referendum was held on the 10th of April and passed by a clearly manipulated vote of 99.7%. The Anschluss, or Union, had finally come about. This union of Austria with Germany was a triumphant moment for Goethe. He could now return to his native Austria and duly did so within days of the Anschluss occurring and he was now under pressure to marry quickly. The SS had a rule which the head of it, Heinrich Himmler, had promulgated that all SS men between the ages of 25 and 30 
were required to get married and start a family. This directive was issued with the intention that these men, the supposed best of the Aryan race, would have numerous children which would go on to flood Germany and its dominions with ideal German citizens. Goethe was already 28 years of age and needed to settle down quickly to conform with this rule. Thus it was that he quickly established a relationship with Annie Geiger, a 23-year-old Austrian woman whom he had met at a motorcycle race. They were wed on the 23rd of October 1938, but not before passing a series of stringent physical tests and interviews set by the SS, and they would have three children in quick succession in the years that followed. Peter was born in 1939, but died in infancy. Werner arrived soon after in 1940, and Ingeborg appeared the following year. Gert would have little contact with them, as Annie and the children spent most of the war, which was to follow, living in Vienna, while Gert was stationed in Poland and elsewhere. Gert's eagerness to abide by Himmler's directive for men of the SS of his age to marry and start a family was indicative of his newfound commitment to the organization in the aftermath of the German annexation of Austria. He now moved away from working with the family business again and committed himself fully to the SS. Much of this activity focused on the extension of the Nazi regime's brutal anti-Semitic policies into the newly acquired territory. The Nuremberg Laws in Germany had earlier robbed the country's Jews of their citizenship and made them into second-class individuals in business and social terms. Now these were extended into Austria, and the persecution of the country's Jewish community began. The severity of it was particularly apparent during the Kristallnacht, Night of the Broken Glass pogroms in November 1938, when Jewish homes and businesses all across Nazi Germany and Austria were destroyed, and thousands of Jews were either killed or seriously wounded. The attacks were particularly severe in Vienna, where most of the city synagogues were burnt, as the capital's people and fire departments looked on and watched. No doubt Goethe was involved in some capacity, and by early 1939 he was serving in the SS Standarte 89, a group of highly organized shock troops in Vienna. It appears on a largely full-time basis, although he maintained some minimal links with the family publishing business. As Goethe was establishing his family in Vienna, the new German Third Reich was becoming ever more aggressive in its approach and willingness to test the patience of Britain and France. Following the union with Austria, Hitler almost immediately began making noises about the Sudetenland, a region in Czechoslovakia with a large population of ethnic German people living in it. Hitler insisted that if the Sudetenland was ceded to Germany, it would be the last claim he would make on territory in Europe. Taking the bait, the British and French agreed to this at a conference in Munich in September 1938. But it was nowhere near the end of Hitler's territorial ambitions. By the spring of 1939, he pressed forward again, effectively annexing the rest of Czechoslovakia and bringing Hungary into the German sphere of influence. By now, the situation was clear, and the British and French insisted that any further aggressive action would result in a declaration of war. That duly followed when the German army invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Hitler's Germany. The Second World War had begun. Goethe was soon involved in combat. At the start of hostilities, he was transferred to the SS combat unit Sturmband 111, and on the 9th of March 1940, he was promoted by Himmler to serve as a Verwaltungsführer, or administrative leader, of a Sonderkommando, or special unit. These units would soon be centrally involved in the Nazis' war crimes and after serving as the administrative leader in Upper Silesia for several months, Goethe was promoted again to become a technical sergeant and was stationed by now in Katowice, or Katowice in Upper Silesia in Poland. This was an area of Western Poland on the Czech border, which was of major industrial significance to the Reich, being a huge producer of coal and iron. Consequently, in the early stages of the war, a strategy was being developed here to deport or otherwise remove much of the population and effectively colonize it with German settlers. Goethe was involved in this initiative during 1941, 
working as a financial officer and administrator within the office of the Reich Commissioner for the Consolidation of German Nationhood. His ardent commitment to this work was recognized when he was given a certificate of service by his commanding officer praising his service and his commitment to Nazi ideology. Despite the recognition of his usefulness in Katowice, or perhaps because of it, Goethe would soon be employed in a somewhat different fashion. With the outbreak of war, the Nazi state's attitude towards the Jewish community had become more brutal. In the 1930s, the Nazis had begun persecuting its Jewish population through a series of anti-Semitic laws which stripped the Jewish people of their citizenship and through attacks on Jewish businesses. But much worse was to follow upon the outbreak of the war. There was now an unfolding policy of forced exile. The Jews of Central Europe, and in particular the huge Jewish population within Poland, would be brutalized until they agreed to leave the Nazi Reich altogether, while pogroms and killings of Jewish people increased, and things grew more radical still as the war effort expanded. In the spring of 1940, the Germans conquered Denmark and Norway, followed very soon after by France and the Low Countries. With its dominance of continental Europe largely achieved, the Nazis began considering the possibility of mass forced deportations or even massacres of the Jewish people, tens of thousands of whom were now being rounded up and forced into Jewish ghettos and a network of concentration camps which were being constructed across Central and Eastern Europe. Goethe would have been entirely familiar with the camp system from his time in Western Poland, but it took on an even more sinister hue in late 1941 and early 1942, when the Nazi regime determined that it would begin mass murdering Europe's Jews in the concentration camps, generally by gassing hundreds or thousands of people every day and immediately burning their corpses. The final solution, as it was termed, was adopted as Reich policy by Hitler and the other leaders in the summer of 1941, and news of its employment was relayed to a conference of senior Nazi administrators at Wannsee outside Berlin in January 1942, and Goethe was quickly involved in this sinister activity. In the summer of that year, he was reassigned to Lublin in eastern Poland, where he worked under Odilo Globocznik, himself an Austrian Nazi. Globocznik was charged with a senior role in constructing and expanding three concentration camps at Belzec, Sobibor and Treblinka, and rounding up and sending hundreds of thousands of Polish Jews to these camps, which would become some of the most horrific centers of the Holocaust, which was just commencing. In the months that followed, Goethe observed Globocznik's methods, which included a mix of severe brutality towards the Polish Jews being sent to these camps, and also a striking level of corruption. Globocznik used the inmates of the camps as mass slave labor, and he was siphoning off much of the profits from the work they performed to benefit himself. Goethe would follow these same practices himself before long. On the 11th of February 1943, Goethe was promoted again. It was a major elevation. He was to become commandant or governor effectively of a new concentration camp which was to be constructed at Krakow Boisov on the site of an already existing smaller labor camp. His reputation preceded him. Already before he arrived, the Jewish people of Krakow knew Goethe as the bloody dog of Lublin. His behavior at his new station would more than justify that designation. Goethe's first task upon arrival was to see to the camp's construction on a 200-acre site which, to add insult to injury, was being built over two Jewish cemeteries. To facilitate this on the 13th of March 1943, the Jewish ghetto in Krakow was liquidated, and the remaining Jewish prisoners from within it were moved to the new camp as slave laborers, though a significant proportion of the ghetto residents was simply killed on the spot or was sent to one of the death camps. The facility was quickly constructed at Krakow Boisov using the newcomers and within weeks it was a fully operational concentration camp. Upon its completion, Goethe delivered a speech to the camp's inhabitants in which he ominously stated, I am your God. The concentration camp of Krakow Poisov was not one of the foremost centers of the Holocaust which eventually led to the mass murder of approximately 6 million Jews across Europe between 1941 
and 1945, as well as the murder of hundreds of thousands of Roma people, Soviet prisoners of war, and other groups which the Nazis wished to eradicate. That distinction lay with the major death camps such as Auschwitz-Birkenau in western Poland and Treblinka, where hundreds of thousands of people were gassed to death, over a million alone in the case of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Rather, krakow Płasów was strictly a concentration camp, insofar as it was a source of slave labor, and a camp where people were held or concentrated for periods of time until they were shipped out to Auschwitz or one of the other death camps. There were no gas chambers or crematoria here, as there were at these more notorious death camps. As such, krakow Płasów was primarily a way station before Polish Jews were sent off to Auschwitz, while it also functioned to produce war material and other goods for the German war effort or civilian population back in Germany. Goethe was a particularly sadistic administrator in all of this. When he organized the deportation of trainloads of the camp's Jewish children to Auschwitz, he would refer to them as being sent to kindergarten. This is not to suggest that no deaths occurred at krakow Płasów. Many thousands died there. A large proportion of these fatalities occurred owing to the appalling conditions of the camp, where diseases such as typhus ran riot. Others simply died of a combination of malnutrition and being overworked. The average daily ration of food for the Jewish inmates consisted of just a few hundred calories, typically comprised of watery soup and stale bread. When this inadequate diet was combined with a punishing daily work schedule of between 10 and 14 hours of hard labor, the inmates could only last for so long before their physical condition began to deteriorate sharply. Some agreed to collaborate with the camp authorities and became guards in order to acquire a double ration of food. However, a greater proportion of the deaths at krakow Płasów were owing to pure brutality. Infringements of the camp's rules or any effort at insubordination or attempt to escape could result in an immediate execution. These were carried out in a staged fashion, much of the time with the goal of terrorizing the camp's inmates by having them witness the systematic shooting of those who had dared disobey the rules or would not work hard enough. Central to this brutality, Amon Goethe would often order mass shootings as an example to the entire camp. Others later testified that he would regularly find reason to shoot somebody before he had even had his breakfast. In the daytime, during which Kurt was often quite drunk, he would parade through the camp with his two dogs, Rolf a Great Dane and Ralf an Alsatian, who were trained to viciously attack individuals. Occasionally, shots were fired out of the window of Goethe's villa, where he lived in the center of the camp, at workers which he had observed as working too slowly. If one member of a work team committed an offense, Goethe saw to it that everyone was punished, the most brutal instance being when he killed every fifth member of a team from which one individual had seemingly escaped. These murders were often carried out to Huyova Gurka, a large hill in the camp where it is estimated that between 8,000 and 12,000 people were murdered in the 18 months or so that krakow Płasów was under the command of Goethe, or roughly 20 people per day. Unsurprisingly, the camp inmates were terrified of Goethe and often tried to hide when he walked about the camp. One survivor later testified that, when you saw Goethe, you saw death. During Goethe's time at Lublin and the first months at krakow Płasów, the war effort more broadly for Germany and its allies was turning sour. In the summer of 1941, Hitler had decided to abandon the campaign which had been initiated against Britain the previous year, of forcing it to surrender through a naval blockade and a major bombing campaign. Instead, the Nazis turned eastwards once again and invaded the Soviet Union. At first, the war on the Eastern Front was incredibly successful. By the late autumn, the Wehrmacht had advanced near to Moscow and Leningrad and had captured vast swathes of territory in Ukraine, Belarus, and Western Russia. The Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, even considered negotiating a peace in which he would cede much of this captured territory to Germany. Yet he refrained from doing so, and as the bitter Russian winter set in, the German advance was stopped and hundreds of thousands of men began to freeze. By 1942, the Russians were pushing back and a major victory in the southern city of Stalingrad in the autumn and winter of 1942 broke the deadlock. 
the Russians began pushing the Germans westwards in 1943. Moreover, the United States had entered the war in December 1941, and in the course of 1943, the Western Allies defeated the Italians and Germans in North Africa, and then opened a southern front in Europe in Italy. Defeat was now assured for the Nazis. Among Goethe's activities at Krakow, Poissov, and the camp more generally are perhaps much more well known today for having involved Oskar Schindler. Schindler was a German industrialist who hailed from the Sudetenland region and had something of a dissolute early adulthood, being arrested for public drunkenness on several occasions in the early 1930s and flitting from job to job. In the mid-1930s, he became involved with the Nazi movement in Czechoslovakia and became an informant to the party as it tried to gain influence in the Sudetenland region. His role as a party intelligence officer continued even after the Sudetenland was annexed. He was rewarded for his party activity in 1939, when he was given an enamelware factory in Krakow, and it was in this capacity that he would become involved in the events at the krakow poissov concentration camp. Schindler's factory was steadily staffed with Jewish slave laborers from the camp in the early 1940s, as the number of Polish Jews being detained and imprisoned steadily increased. Thus, there is an irony in that an individual who would eventually come to save many of the Jews at Krakow Poissow was paradoxically a long-standing Nazi himself. Schindler became the mastermind behind the rescuing of approximately 1,200 of Krakow Poissow's Jewish inmates and perhaps many more indirectly, made famous by the 1993 Steven Spielberg film. Although Jewish labor was used in his factory in Krakow, he did not treat his workers poorly like so many other factory owners throughout the Reich did. In fact, he was especially kind to them, as he began spending large proportions of his own income and accumulated wealth from the factory in order to obtain black market goods and supplies to better feed and care for the workers and their families. Most significantly, he attempted to save hundreds of individuals. Often this was accomplished by bribing SS officers in the camp to refrain from killing workers or having them sent to Auschwitz or to one of the other death camps. Later, when a decision was taken to begin scaling back the size of Krakow Poissow as the Russians advanced towards Poland, Schindler convinced Goethe to allow him to move his factory and its workers to Brniniec in Czechoslovakia. Goethe agreed on the basis of economic necessity, but for Schindler, what it meant was that he saved the lives of roughly 1,200 Jewish inmates of the camp, whose names he allegedly added to a list which may or may not have existed. These people would otherwise almost certainly have been executed or sent to one of the death camps, as Krakow Poisnov was worn down. Schindler accomplished his valiant work, even in the face of an increasing level of terror at Krakow Poisnov. By mid-1944, the camp's population had increased to its largest size. Originally, it had housed just roughly 2,000 inmates, but at its peak, some 25,000 people were detained there, overseen by approximately 630 guards. And this was also the most intense period of the Holocaust throughout Central and Eastern Europe, and a large proportion of the 150,000 Jewish people who transited through Krakow Poissow on their way to the death camps were sent through here in the spring, summer, and autumn of 1944. Moreover, Goethe's behavior continued to cast a pall of fear around the entire camp. Morning parades were now a common feature of life there. One morning, Goethe shot a man for being too tall. He then urinated on him as he lay dying. Sometimes prisoners would escape executions, but be whipped severely for not working hard enough. As one prisoner, Josef Bau, later reflected, Goethe was a hideous and terrible monster who set the fear of death in people. He ran the camp through extremes of cruelty that are beyond the comprehension of a compassionate mind. The intensification of the brutal activities at Krakow Poissow was occurring as the war was slowly drifting into its final stages. By mid-1944, the Russians were advancing into Poland. Hitler's Italian allies had decided to denounce their own leader, Benito Mussolini, and formed a new government in Rome which sided with the Allies. However, Mussolini was soon rescued by a mission sent by Hitler to central Italy, and a pro-German government was established in northern Italy, initiating a civil war in Italy on the southern front.
Then, in the summer of 1944, the Western Allies, led by the United States and Britain, but with significant support from Canada and other nations, opened a long-planned Western Front in France, following the D-Day landings in Normandy. In the late summer and autumn of 1944, these landings were followed by the liberation of Paris and several other major cities in the Low Countries. By the time the winter of 1944 set in, the Western Allies were preparing for the final push into Western Germany, while the Russians were beginning their military build-up in Poland for a strike on Berlin in the spring of 1945. While the Russians advanced ever westwards, the camps in eastern Poland were beginning to be wound down and dismantled in the summer and autumn of 1944. For instance, on the 6th of August 1944 alone, Goethe shipped 7,500 Jewish women to Auschwitz, and just four days later, over 4,500 Jewish men were sent to the Mauthausen concentration camp. This reduced the population of the camp to about half its size. However, Goethe had departed from Krakow Poissow before it was ever fully closed. By the summer of 1944, his conduct in running the camp was being investigated by the SS. Despite his supposed ideological adherence to the Nazi cause, Goethe had actually been profiting enormously from his role as commandant of Krakow Poissow. There was big money to be made in running one of the slave labor camps. Factories produced huge amounts of goods, which, if siphoned off and sold on the black market, could result in a rich reward. Additionally, as inmates arrived to any of the concentration camps, they were generally stripped of their remaining possessions. Sometimes, valuable items of jewelry and gold and silver watches were found, and these were often claimed by the senior camp administrators as their own private loot. Such avenues of profit were exploited at most camps. Amon Goethe was no exception in profiteering from his time as commandant at Krakow Poissow. Since the spring of 1943, he had been accumulating money and goods which he sent westwards, often back to his wife and children or the offices of his parents' publishing firm in Vienna. This activity became even more frenzied at the camp as it became clear that it would be dismantled in 1944. And one of the reasons why Schindler was able to convince Goethe to allow him to move his factory and workers westwards into Czechoslovakia was that this action would provide Goethe with a smokescreen for also shipping some of his acquired goods westwards. Word of this corrupt activity on Goethe's part reached the authorities within the SS. It was combined with reports of Goethe holding wild drinking parties at the camp with his mistress Ruth Irena Kalder and excessive brutality towards the inmates. The latter action was not criticized on humanitarian grounds. It was simply believed that Goethe should not have been killing workers who were still fit and healthy to be used as slave labor. And these accusations combined were enough to have him removed from his position as commandant of Krakow Poissow on the 13th of September 1944. He was sent back to Berlin to be prosecuted but as the war effort was becoming ever more desperate, the charges were simply dropped in the winter of 1944 and he was released. Goethe had presided over the expansion of the camp at Krakow Poissow as well as its darkest days in 1943 and 1944, but now it was nearing its end. Administration of the camp had been placed in the hands of SS Obersturmführer Arnold Büscher following Goethe's departure. Under Boucher, the mass deportations which had begun under Goethe in the summer of 1944 continued until there were just a few thousand inmates and guards operating there by the early winter of 1944. The final flurry of activity centered on exhuming the remains of the thousands of bodies of individuals who had been executed in the camp during Goethe's reign of terror. These were dug up and their remains burnt on mass pyres Similar scenes of SS officers attempting to destroy the evidence of the mass murders which had occurred at the concentration camps were seen throughout Eastern and Central Europe in the closing months of 1944. Finally, in January 1945, the few remaining camp authorities learned that the Soviets were closing on Krakow. Accordingly, they dismantled some of the last parts of the camps and fled. Unlike other camps where buildings, fences, guard towers and even considerable numbers of prisoners were found, when the Soviets arrived on the 20th of January 1945, they found little sign of any concentration camp at all having been at Krakow Poissow. As all of this was occurring, 
Goethe was moving wildly around Central Europe. Following the dropping of the charges against him and his release, Goethe's primary concern was to ensure that the ill-gotten wealth he had acquired through his corrupt dealings at Krakow Poisov was preserved. Accordingly, in the early spring of 1945, he was traveling around Central Europe, locating large shipments of goods which had been sent from eastern Poland. This included a visit to Oskar Schindler's new factory in Czechoslovakia to try to retrieve some of what had been sent there during the relocation of the factory. However, as he was attempting these actions, Goethe was taken ill and ended up in a hospital initially for some chronic stomach problems he was having. But then he was subsequently moved to an SS medical facility where he was deemed to be mentally unfit. As a result, as it entered the late spring of 1945, Goethe was being detained in a mental institution in Bavaria, where he had spent so many years a decade earlier in exile. It was here he would witness the last stages of the war. The Second World War in Europe had entered its death throes in the winter of 1944. As the snow set in in December, the Western Allies were preparing to build up their forces in Belgium, Luxembourg and northeast France for a major offensive into Western Germany in the late winter. A final push by Hitler to counter-attack into the Bastogne region saw some brief reverses for the Allies, but eventually the Battle of the Bulge ended in Allied victory in January 1945. Moreover, the concentration of some of Germany's last armies in Western Germany to attempt the counter-offensive drew resources away from the Eastern Front, and as the Russians moved into northwest Poland and northeast Germany in the opening months of 1945, they did so with remarkable speed. It was now a race to Berlin for the Allies. The Russians got there first, and it was they who laid siege to the city in the spring of 1945. Finally, surrounded and unwilling to surrender, Hitler killed himself in the Reich Chancellery bunker on the 30th of April 1945. His successor as head of the Nazi state, Joseph Goebbels, followed his example the following day. Exactly one week later, the chief of the Wehrmacht, Wilhelm Keitel, signed the official surrender of Germany, bringing the war in Europe to a conclusion. Goethe was a marked man in the aftermath of the war. The Americans, British and Russians had determined in the course of 1944 and early 1945 that there should not be excessive retribution sought against the German people in the aftermath of the war. Many Germans were simply innocent bystanders of a regime which had seized power with roughly the support of just one third of the country in 1933. Moreover, even those who had fought in the Wehrmacht between 1939 and 1945 were more often than not young men who had been conscripted into service or who had shown minimal adherence to the Nazi ideological stance. Fewer still were guilty of actual war crimes or of having committed the worst atrocities associated with the regime. However, this clemency would only extend so far. Those who were at the top of the German government or who had been involved in committing war crimes were to be prosecuted to the full extent, while the SS, of which Goethe was a senior member, were all to be charged with crimes, as the most ideological branch of the Nazi party and also the organization which had overseen the concentration camps and the mass murder of millions of Jewish people, Roma, Soviet prisoners of war and other political dissenters. As such, Goethe would be prosecuted if captured. It did not take long for him to be apprehended, and there was no flight or attempt to evade capture. The former commandant of Krakow Poisov was still being held in a mental institution in Bavaria, and he was arrested there by the United States military. Goethe had donned the uniform of an ordinary rank-and-file German soldier in order to cover up his identity as a senior SS officer. As a result, he was not immediately detained as somebody who was to be prosecuted for war crimes and was sent to Dachau concentration camp nearby, which had been repurposed by the Allies as a holding center for German soldiers while they were being investigated to see if they were to be tried on any charges. Here he was finally identified by one Josef Yevkovich. Yevkovich had met Goethe several years earlier in early 1943, when the Krakow Poisov camp was first being expanded after Goethe's arrival. At that time, Goethe had once pointed his gun at the teenage Yevkovich's head, 
he survived only because a Jewish policeman there assaulted the teenager and then told Gert to save his bullet because Yefkovich was dead. Now, nearly three years later, he identified the man who had once nearly killed him. And once the Allies knew who he was, Gert was extradited to Poland for prosecution. Gert was sent to Poland in 1946 with Rudolf Hess, the commandant of Auschwitz, during much of the period of the Holocaust. While the major surviving leaders of the Nazi regime itself, such as Hermann Goering, Albert Speer and Joachim von Ribbentrop, were being tried at the main war crimes trial in Nuremberg in Germany, individuals such as Hess and Goethe, who had run the concentration camps on Polish soil and murdered hundreds of thousands of Polish citizens, were to be tried in Poland. Accordingly, Goethe's trial commenced in Warsaw on the 27th of August 1946, it lasted just 10 days. The Gert that entered court was different to the one who had been arrested in Germany a year earlier. During the war, he had gained a lot of weight and drank heavily while he oversaw the camp at Krakow Płasow. The very fact that he had been admitted to a mental institution in the dying stages of the war is evidence enough of his shattered state of mind in early 1945. But as he entered the courtroom in Warsaw, he was more composed and had determined to provide his own defense and cross-examine witnesses himself. Nevertheless, there was no doubt from the very beginning that Goethe was going to be found guilty. The indictment, after all, directly accused him of being responsible for murdering at least 8,000 people at Krakow Płasow and other locations such as the Krakow Ghetto. The prosecution called 70 witnesses over 10 days, many of which provided damning evidence of Goethe's actions at Krakow Płasow and elsewhere. Unlike Hearst, who freely admitted during his trial that he had done what he did at Auschwitz, but who based his defense on the argument that he was simply following orders, Goethe consistently tried to deny the truth of the claims made against him. One of his arguments was that individuals were only shot at the camp if they were found to be in possession of explosives. It was all a paltry display, and even the few people that Goethe called as witnesses in his defense instead corroborated the prosecution witnesses' statements about Goethe's brutality. It was no surprise when, on the 5th of September, the court found Goethe guilty of all charges and sentenced him to be hanged. The execution was carried out just eight days later. He was hanged on the grounds of the Krakow Płasow labor camp on the 13th of September 1946, after which his body was cremated and the ashes thrown into the Vistula River. He was survived by his wife and two surviving children. Annie Goethe had earlier applied for a divorce. He also had an illegitimate child, Monica Hertwig, through his affair with Ruth Calder. Root continued to defend Goethe and his actions for decades to come before committing suicide in 1983. But what of Goethe's binary opposite at Krakow Płasow? Oskar Schindler was briefly a fugitive after the war. Some of the Jewish people whose lives he had saved prepared letters for him to carry with him, attesting to his actions. But his fear was of falling into Russian hands. As such, he set off westwards with little more than the clothes on his back, having spent all the profits from his factory on bribes and black market goods earlier. Eventually, he and his wife made it to the American lines and arrangements were made for a pardon. They settled down in Bavaria in the autumn of 1945, but much of the remainder of Schindler's life was turbulent. He suffered several business reverses, emigrated to Argentina with his wife in 1949, but then returned to Germany later without her after going bankrupt in 1958. A further bankruptcy followed back in Germany in 1963, as well as a heart attack and continued poor health thereafter. However, Schindler was able to survive through these years based largely on donations from several of the Jewish people whose lives he had saved and with whom he had maintained contacts over the years. When he died in October 1974, his body was taken to Jerusalem, where he was buried on Mount Zion. It would be hard to find another figure who stood in such absolute contrast to Amon Gert. Amon Gert was amongst the most brutal of the senior and mid-ranking members of the Nazi regime and the SS. What is perhaps striking about this is that there was not an abundance of evidence of how brutal his tenure as commandant of Krakow Płasow would be during his earlier life the only child of a well-to-do couple 
who run a prosperous Viennese publishing house. He certainly exhibited a rebellious streak from a young age, but there were few signs of overt brutality. Although his political actions became more and more extreme as the years went by, we do not find him engaging in acts of overt violence throughout the late 1920s, while his terrorist activities in the 1930s were acts of direct political violence rather than exhibitions of pure sadism. Indeed, there were even significant periods of time during which he worked within the family business, and for nearly three years between 1934 and 1937, he effectively left the SS and was not an active member of the organization. Thereafter, when the war broke out, he performed several largely administrative roles before being transferred east to work in the growing network of officials charged with incarcerating Poland's Jews and either setting them to work as slave labor or deporting them to the death camps. It was during these years, in the early 1940s, that the already ideologically radical Amon developed the brutal streak which would characterize his reign at Krakow Płasow. In Poland during the early 1940s, he observed his immediate superiors, figures such as Odilo Globocznik, terrorized the Jewish people over whose lives they exercised so much authority. Consequently, Goethe's time in Katowice and Lublin acted as a macabre training school for him to acquire the brutality which he deployed at Krakow Płasow. Here he dehumanized the thousands of Jewish inmates and murdered people savagely on a whim, while others were beaten and tortured. All were psychologically traumatized by Goethe and his impulsive violence. Yet his reign at Krakow Płasow also attests to the hypocrisy of the upper ranks of the SS. Before Krakow Płasow was fully dismantled, its commandant was arrested for having profited extensively himself from the running of the camp, rather than filtering the camp's profits to the Nazi regime back in Berlin. Moreover, his reign there is lent a darker hue when it stands beside the noble actions of Oskar Schindler and his efforts to save as many of the Jews of Krakow Płasow as he could. What do you think of Amon Goethe? Was he psychologically unbalanced all along? And does this explain some of his behavior? Or was he more of an ideological Nazi committed to the xenophobic policies of the Third Reich? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as Oskar Schindler was born on the 28th of April 1908 in the town of Zwitau, in the Moravia region of what was then the Empire of Austria-Hungary, but is today the Czech Republic. His father was Johann Schindler, who went by the name of Hans and owned a farm machinery business. His mother was Franziska Schindler, née Luzer, a homemaker. She and Hans had one other child, a daughter named Elfriede, who was born in 1915. The Schindlers lived in a region of the Austro-Hungarian Empire known as the Sudetenland. Unlike most of the other parts of what would one day become the Czech Republic, this region was primarily inhabited by ethnic Sudeten Germans rather than Czechs. Thus, the Sudetenland was culturally closer to Germany than the world of Prague, which lay only a few hours away. Growing up, Schindler and all of his neighbors would have spoken German as their first language. Oscar had a tumultuous childhood in his early years here. His father was a heavy drinker and womanizer who engaged in extramarital affairs and was emotionally unstable. It was claimed that he had once raped his sister-in-law during a drunken episode, an incident which allegedly resulted in the birth of an illegitimate child, Oscar's half-sister, who appears to have died in her youth. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the relationship between father and son was antagonistic from early on. Oscar attended the local elementary and secondary schools. He was not exactly a dedicated student, but there is otherwise a frustrating lack of information about his childhood years, a gap which Schindler did not try to fill when interviewed in later years. While Oscar was growing up, Events were occurring across Europe which would have huge consequences for the continent and indeed Schindler's own life path. They would also make him a national of a different country before he reached his teenage years. Ever since the 1870s, the great powers of Europe, Britain, France, Germany, Russia and Austria-Hungary had been on a collision course with each other 
fueled by colonial rivalry in the scramble for Africa and nationalism and competition between Austria, Hungary and Russia to claim territory in the Balkans as the Ottoman Empire collapsed there. Eventually, in the summer of 1914, these simmering tensions exploded into war after a crisis between the Austro-Hungarian government and the Kingdom of Serbia in the Balkans ballooned out of control. In the early days of August, an alliance of Britain, France and Russia went to war with Austria, Hungary and Germany, who were also allied with Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire. The conflict would soon expand to become the First World War, as powers such as Japan and the United States eventually became involved. As they did, Germany and Austria-Hungary faced impossible odds and eventually, in 1918, the war resulted in defeat for the two Central European powers. Even before the war ended, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was entering a crisis which would have profound implications for Schindler's homeland in the Sudetenland. As it became clear that the war effort was doomed in the late summer and early autumn of 1918, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was comprised of a wide array of different nationalities such as the Hungarians, Czechs, Croats, Slovaks and Serbs, began to fall apart. In October 1918, weeks before the First World War actually ended, Czech and Slovak separatists in the northern parts of the empire declared independence from Vienna announcing the creation of a new independent state of Czechoslovakia. This included Schindler's native region, the Sudetenland, a territory which admittedly was comprised much more of ethnically German families like the Schindlers than either Czechs or Slovaks. The new Czechoslovak government was unclear how to proceed in the aftermath of the war regarding predominantly German parts of their new nation, like the Sudetenland, and asked the main victors in the war Britain, France and the US to adjudicate on the matter during the peace negotiations at Versailles outside Paris in 1919. The general consensus here was that both Germany and Austria should be weakened as much as possible in the aftermath of the war. Thus, the Treaty of Saint-Germain, which covered the post-war settlement in the lands of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, decreed that the Sudetenland would remain a part of the newly formed state of Czechoslovakia. Consequently, Schindler grew up from 1918 onwards as a citizen of this new state. The issue of the Sudetenland, though, would emerge again soon. After just about making his way through secondary school in the early 1920s, Schindler went on to a technical school. However, he was expelled from here in 1924, shortly after his arrival, for forging his grade report. Eventually, he was allowed back though henceforth he was referred to by his classmates as Schindler the Crook. This was not the only issue of criminality which he confronted around this time. In 1925, Hans Schindler, who sold insurance premiums as a side job to make extra money, was accused by some of his customers of embezzling money from them. Hans, in turn, blamed his son for the crime, though many years later, Oscar's wife would claim that Hans had himself been responsible. Whoever the culprit was, it resulted in further legal difficulties for Oscar when he was still shy of his 18th birthday. However, he was soon allowed to return to the technical college he had been expelled from, from which he managed to graduate. Following this, he headed to Brno, a large Czech town, where he took several courses on machinery, chauffeuring and the repair and maintenance of heaters. He passed exams for these, paving the way to work in the family business. Oscar met his future wife in the autumn of 1927. Emily, Millie Peltzel, was seven months older than Oscar and from the village of Stare Maletin, about 40 kilometers from Zwitau. Her father was a prosperous farmer and the Peltzels had a harmonious family life, in contrast to that of the Schindlers. The occasion of their first encounter was when Oscar, who had been working for his father's business on and off since 1924, had arrived to the Peltzl farm on business and tried to sell Emily's father an electric generator for their house. Oscar was apparently infatuated with Emily upon first meeting her and continued to visit the Peltzl farm thereafter, inventing reasons to do so about farm machinery and the like, but in reality in search of opportunities to woo Emily. It worked, 
and after several weeks of this, she accepted his marriage proposal. They were wed on the 6th of March 1928, but from the offset, it was a problematic union. The newlyweds moved into the Schindler house occupying the upstairs, but Hans Schindler's heavy drinking and crude behavior proved problematic. It was the beginning of a marriage that would have many peaks and valleys over the next 30 years. The years that followed did not bring much better. Oscar had received a considerable dowry from Emily's father when they married, but he then spent much of this in a somewhat reckless fashion in 1928, indulging his desire to become a race car driver. This enterprise faltered after just a few months with the loss of much of their savings. Thereafter, he quit working for his father and took a job with the Moravian Electric Company in Brno. But this soon fell through as well, and instead, he opened a racing school. Again, this was interrupted by an 18-month stint in the Czechoslovak Army, where he served in the 10th Infantry Regiment, eventually rising to the rank of Lance Corporal. However, in the climate of the late 1920s and early 1930s, there was little prospect of Czechoslovakia ending up at war, and Oscar later noted that his time as a conscript was filled more with recreational activities than any real soldiering. When his time of service was done, he returned to working with the Moravian Electric Company, but hard times were hitting Europe economically in the 1930s, and the company soon shut down. In this environment, Emily began to criticize Oscar for having squandered the money he had received from her father when they married in 1928. There was, though, a growing problem of another kind. Oscar had inherited his father's liking for alcohol. This had been something of an issue from the early days of his marriage to Emily, but it became increasingly problematic during the early 1930s, once he found himself out of work and at a loose end. He was arrested twice in 1931 and 1932 for public drunkenness and was imprisoned on one of these occasions for 24 hours before being fined and released. However, this early experience of detention did not deter him and Oscar was arrested two more times before the end of 1932. Eventually, he was sentenced to four days in prison and fined 200 crowns, a not insignificant sum for a couple down on their luck financially and a man who was out of work. Things improved moderately from that point on, but it would not be his last brush with the law and his increasing alcoholism continued unabated, albeit with fewer run-ins with the police. If it became more controlled over time, it was because later in 1932, Oscar did find a new job with the Yaroslav Simek Bank in Prague. He would work there for six years, and he and Emily moved into a large house shortly after he acquired the job, one which she later described as a mansion compared with the old Schindler house. There were further problems waiting during this period. At some stage in the early 1930s, Oscar, who had also acquired his father's womanizing ways, began having an affair with a woman called Auruli Schlegel, whom he had known since his childhood and who had worked as a secretary for Hans Schindler. Two illegitimate children were soon born, Edith and Oscar Jr. Emily, with whom Oscar never had any children, was seemingly fully aware of the affair after a certain point and of the children born out of wedlock. Oscar was a neglectful parent, in part perhaps because he may have doubted that he was actually Edith and Oscar Jr.'s father to begin with. One might ask at this point why Emily stayed with him in what were already rocky first years to their marriage. She later stated that, in spite of his flaws, Oscar had a big heart and was always ready to help whoever was in need. He was affable, kind, extremely generous and charitable, but at the same time, not mature at all. He constantly lied and deceived me and later returned feeling sorry, like a boy caught in mischief, asking to be forgiven one more time, and then we would start all over again. Thus, the pattern of much of Schindler's life, the drinking, the affairs and the shaky finances were all in evidence from the early 1930s onwards. While Schindler's personal affairs were becoming rockier in the early 1930s, events were occurring beyond the borders of Czechoslovakia 
which would soon have a bearing on Oscar's own life and that of his country, and then subsequently on global affairs. In neighboring Germany, the country's politics had descended into revolution and instability in the period immediately after the end of the First World War. The ruler of the German Empire, Kaiser Wilhelm II, had abdicated in the closing days of the war, bringing the empire to an end. It was replaced by a new republic. But this encountered severe unrest and revolutions in cities like Berlin and Munich, as socialists and communists attempted to claim power in the same manner that the Bolsheviks had in Russia in 1917. A counter-revolution of right-wing German nationalists rose up to meet this left-wing revolution. Many political movements emerged out of this, one of the most extreme being the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazis, headed by Adolf Hitler. Based on an ideology of seeking revenge for Germany's humiliation and loss of territory in the First World War, as well as a conspiracy theory that Jews and Communists were seeking to destroy Germany, the Nazis soon attempted a revolt in their core base in Bavaria in November 1923. This insurrection had failed, and the stabilization of Germany's politics in the mid-1920s left the Nazis a peripheral, minor political force in southern Germany for most of the remainder of the 1920s. All of this changed, though, in late 1929. That autumn, the economic boom which had benefited Europe and the Americas for years came to a shuddering halt as the stock markets on Wall Street in New York City incurred huge losses. The Great Depression followed, and Germany was hit particularly badly on account of its huge national debt, the result of having enormous war reparations payments imposed on it by Britain and France at the end of the First World War. As ordinary Germans lost their jobs and their life savings, millions of Germans turned to more radical political groups. The Nazis suddenly surged in support, becoming the second largest political party in the country in elections in 1930, and then the largest in 1932. Although the political establishment tried to prevent their ascendancy for a time, eventually, in January 1933, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, and the Nazis soon acquired a dictatorial grip on power, following the passage of an enabling act, which allowed them to rule by decree in the spring of 1933. The rise of the Nazis heralded a change in Europe's political landscape, for their political ideology included the idea of uniting all predominantly German-populated parts of Europe under the leadership of one state, a new German Empire, the Third Reich. This necessarily included Austria, some parts of Western Poland, and Schindler's native Sudetenland. Schindler's personal politics is a matter of considerable dispute, Following a visit to Berlin in 1931, he expressed some sympathy for the Communist Party there. It is strange then to learn that in 1935, he became a member of the Sudeten German Party, a political party which was founded in Czechoslovakia shortly after the Nazis seized power in Germany, with the goal of fostering separatist sentiment and activity in the Sudetenland. The ultimate goal of the party was to bring the Sudetenland under German control, in assessing this and much of Schindler's activities in the mid to late 1930s, we have to remember that Schindler, like many other supporters of the Nazis, cannot have predicted the extent of the genocidal violence which they would unleash across Europe in years to come. He joined the party as a German nationalist, who, like a massive number of other ethnically German people in the Sudetenland, wanted to see the region united with Germany. Schindler also experienced a profound personal tragedy at this time, when his mother, whom he had loved dearly, died in 1935. Hans Schindler had abandoned her in her final illness, and Oscar, whose relationship with his father was always poor at best, never forgave him, although they made some partial reconciliation years later, in 1941. Meanwhile, in the mid-1930s, Schindler's alcohol and money problems continued. He claimed in later years that these were the reason why he joined the Abwehr in 1936, though his wife later asserted that his first contact with the agency was through an affair with a woman who was also a member of the organization, whom he met on a business trip to Krakow in Poland 
The Abwehr was the German intelligence service which had been established all the way back in 1920, during the period of the German Weimar Republic. As soon as the Nazis seized power in Germany, it was quickly turned into an instrument of foreign intelligence used to undermine Germany's neighbors, particularly Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Poland, each of which held territory which the Nazis believed should be incorporated into a greater Germany. Schindler's activities with the organization primarily seem to have been in the shape of recruiting others, notably people in positions of influence within business and finance, a task which he was well suited to given his years working in various business roles and his acquisition of a position with the Yaroslav Simek Bank in Prague in 1932. Recruitment was seemingly not the only task Schindler undertook for the Abwehr in the mid-1930s. He was also involved in collecting information about railways in Czechoslovakia, military installations and the Czechoslovak army. These were all tasks which Schindler was well placed to perform. He had been in the Czechoslovak army himself just a few years earlier and had extensive contacts within it, while he traveled a lot for business, providing a cover for the collection of information and the meeting of contacts. There is also little doubt as to what the information he was gathering was for. It was for the purposes of planning a potential German invasion of the country, whether to seize the Sudetenland or all of Czechoslovakia. Moreover, he was involved increasingly in the documenting of internal conditions in Poland, a relationship with the country which would have consequences in years to come. Years later, Oscar attempted to downplay the extent of his involvement with the Abwehr, claiming he was a small player who got in over his head at the time as he sought extra money to pay off his growing debts. But others stated that Schindler was one of Germany's most senior intelligence agents in Czechoslovakia during these years. The latter assessment would seem to be corroborated by the fact that he was arrested by the Czechoslovak government for espionage in the summer of 1938 and was held for several months. As Schindler was becoming more involved with the Nazis and the Abwehr within Czechoslovakia, the Nazis in Germany were becoming more aggressive on the international stage. Under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which had brought the First World War to an end and concluded the specific peace terms with Germany, the country was prohibited from having an army of more than 100,000 men and completely barred from establishing an air force. But in 1935, the Nazi government had declared to the world its intention to breach these restrictions and began building both a new air force and recruiting upwards of half a million soldiers. A year later, the Rhineland region of Western Germany, which had been demilitarized under the terms of Versailles, was re-militarized. Then, as the inexorable drift towards war continued, Hitler began making it known to the European powers that he wished for Austria to unite with Germany into a greater Germany. This had been briefly proposed following the First World War, but Britain and others had prohibited such a measure. Many within Austria were in favor of the idea, but the hardline right-wing government tried its best to oppose it. That is, until March 1938, when Vienna agreed to hold a referendum on the matter. Before it could ever be held, Hitler sent the new German army into Austria. In the days that followed, the union of the two countries, referred to as the Anschluss, was completed peacefully. This certainly did not end Nazi claims on foreign territory. As soon as Nazi flags were flying above Vienna, Hitler turned his attentions to Schindler's native Sudetenland. This region, he began arguing to the governments in London, Paris and Rome, should never have been allowed to form part of Czechoslovakia to begin with, as it was primarily comprised of German-speaking, ethnically German people. Furthermore, the Nazis soon established a new paramilitary unit known as the Sudeten Deutsches Freikorps within Czechoslovakia. It was clear that the intention was to launch a low-level internecine war using this militia if the Sudetenland was not given to Germany. In mid-1938, when these arguments were put forward aggressively, Britain and France were in no position to press back against Hitler's demands. They had drastically scaled back their own armed forces during the interwar period and were now ill-equipped to confront Nazi aggression. 
Accordingly, when a conference was convened in the city of Munich in southern Germany in September 1938 to adjudicate on the issue of Schindler's homeland, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and his French counterpart, Edouard Daladier, capitulated to Hitler's demands on the proviso that the Nazis would not seek any more territories in Europe. Thus, the Sudetenland passed into German control following the Munich Conference. The German annexation of the Sudetenland had more implications for Oskar Schindler than for most other inhabitants of this region. In the immediate term, it won him his freedom, as he was still imprisoned for his espionage activities at the time of the Munich Conference. He was released within days. Evidently, Schindler's role in the Abwehr in the mid-1930s must have been greater than he later claimed, for with the annexation of the Sudetenland in the autumn of 1938 and his release from prison, Oscar suddenly came into a significant amount of money. Just a few weeks later, he applied to join the Nazi party. Though, curiously, for an individual who had been an active Abwehr agent for years, his application was delayed for months on account of his several arrests in the 1930s for public drunkenness. It was finally accepted in the spring of 1939, by which time he and Emily had relocated to Ostrava, a city in the northeast of what is now Czechia, near the Czech-Polish border. Here, Schindler resumed his work with the Abwehr, continuing to act as a spy to undermine Czechoslovakia and Poland. Though the details of his life at this time are again disputed, as Schindler was reticent about discussing his espionage work prior to the war in later years. The annexation of the Sudetenland did not pacify Hitler in the way that the British and French had hoped at Munich in 1938 an aspiration which seems retrospectively naive. No sooner had Nazi administrators moved into the Sudetenland than Hitler and his ministers in Berlin began planning for the complete annexation of the remainder of Czechoslovakia. This was duly undertaken in March 1939, yet still the British and French, who were now scrambling to rearm, did not declare war. This was not to occur for several months yet, in the meantime, the Nazis also moved into parts of the Baltic states by annexing the city of Memel in what had once been the Prussian part of Germany. In the weeks and months that followed, the usual set of demands began issuing forth from Berlin concerning Germany's eastern neighbour, Poland. On this occasion, London and Paris made it clear that any breach of Polish sovereignty would constitute an act of war on Germany's part. Thus, when the Nazis invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939, after a false flag operation, Britain and France responded by declaring war on Germany two days later. The Second World War had commenced. One of its most curious outcomes would be that it would bring a businessman from the Sudetenland with a checkered personal history to international renown. As we have seen, the details of what Schindler was doing in 1939 are not entirely clear today. This is hardly surprising. As a spy, he was trying to disguise his activities. Yet while much of the finer details are not known, there's no doubting that he was involved in a significant way in gathering intelligence on Poland in the run-up to the German invasion of the country. Given this, it is also not surprising to find that he was heading for Krakow by October 1939 the city which was established as the center of the German occupation government in Poland. The country had been quickly conquered by the German Wehrmacht in a campaign which lasted little more than a month after the initial invasion. Thereafter, a huge chunk of the country was annexed to Germany, but the central and southern parts of Poland were formed into a new entity named the General Government of Poland. This included the cities of Krakow and Warsaw. The goal of the general government was to prepare this region for a form of modern colonization, whereby the Polish population would be turned into an underclass who would serve German newcomers who moved to the region. It was here in the general government that Schindler would spend most of the Second World War. Schindler did not arrive to Poland as a Nazi official or in his capacity as an Abwehr agent. He remained a member of the intelligence service until 1940, but after the invasion of Poland, his role within the organization was largely in abeyance. 
Rather, his purpose in traveling to Krakow in the days after the completion of the conquest of the country was to use his position as someone who had facilitated the German takeover of both Czechoslovakia and Poland and had influence within the Nazi regime to develop business interests in occupied Poland. He also had previous contacts and experience of Krakow, having visited the city on business in years gone by. At first, his actions in the late autumn of 1939 took the shape of operating as a black marketer and smuggler. This was a period when, as in any war or its immediate aftermath, government oversight and regulation was minimal, and people who were able to wheel and deal could acquire small fortunes during the rapid changeover of businesses and properties. Schindler was able to use his contacts and some bribes to put himself into an advantageous position in this environment and soon had accumulated a large amount of money. He was quickly able to put both his cash and his influence to more sustained use. In January 1940, he acquired the ownership of a factory in Krakow using money provided to him by a number of Jewish financiers who were looking to disguise their wealth as much as possible at this time, before it was effectively robbed from them by the Nazi regime. At the factory, Schindler set up a business making enamelware, which he named the German Enamelware Factory. It started small, with Schindler hiring just over a half a dozen Jewish workers, including a man called Abraham Bankier, who had owned the factory before Schindler purchased it. It should be noted, though, that Schindler's motive to hire Jewish workers at this point may have been more motivated by economics than ethics, as the laws which the German occupation government had put in place stipulated that Jews had to be paid less than their Polish equivalents, and Krakow was a city with a very large Jewish population. Before long, Schindler was hiring more and more Jewish workers, as his operation was a major success. In large part, because Schindler was able to use his influence and contacts within the Nazi regime to acquire contracts to provide his enamelware to the German army. And as it met with success, Schindler, for the first time in his life, found himself not only out of debt, but acquiring considerable wealth very quickly. When Schindler went to Poland late in 1939, he was arriving to the part of Europe which had the highest concentration of Jewish people anywhere in the continent, approximately three and a half million altogether. This was very significant. The Nazis were rabidly anti-Semitic and Hitler's political creed was based on the idea that a vast Jewish conspiracy was afoot to destroy Germany and the Aryan races of Europe. Accordingly, from their very first ascent to power in 1933, the regime had begun persecuting Germany's roughly half a million Jewish people. At the outset, this had involved the introduction of a series of laws which effectively robbed German Jews of their citizenship and persecuted them economically and socially. The idea was to apply enough pressure that they would eventually decide to leave Germany altogether. However, even before the war broke out, there was a drift towards a more extreme approach to what was deemed the Jewish question by the Nazis. In November 1938, a series of pogroms occurred in coordinated attacks across Germany, Austria and the Sudetenland, whereby Jewish businesses, synagogues and homes were attacked. Hundreds of Jews were killed and tens of thousands were detained and sent to concentration camps, which had been constructed across Germany to house political prisoners and supposed enemies of the Nazi state. These attacks on Kristallnacht, or the Night of the Broken Glass, as it has become known, presaged events from September 1939 onwards. Once the Nazis arrived into Poland, they could no longer look to simply pressure the Reich's Jews into leaving, not when millions of Jews lived in Poland. As such, more aggressive measures were deployed from late 1939 onwards. These involved the severe disenfranchisement of the country's Jews, but also a policy of forcing Poland's Jewish people to move into ghettos in certain cities, the most notorious of which was the Warsaw Ghetto. This was effectively turned into a vast open-air prison in 1940 and 1941, one which housed nearly 400,000 Polish Jews in an area of land measuring under four square kilometers. At its peak, there were eight or nine people living on average in every room in the ghetto, 
beyond these cramped conditions, life in the Warsaw Ghetto had some surface veneer of normality in the early part of the war, but in reality, the Nazis began starving the Jewish people within to death, severely restricting the food supply into this part of the city in the months that followed, so that the average Jew here was surviving on just a few hundred calories of food per day. Other plans were afoot to forcibly deport millions of Jews beyond Europe's boundaries to the Levant or, in a particularly dystopian plan, to the East African island of Madagascar. However, these would soon give way to even more insidious plans in ways which would shape Schindler's life. In these early days of the persecution of Poland's Jews, Schindler's activities were a balance between his business activities and also humane treatment of his workers. For instance, unlike the conditions which prevailed for Jews elsewhere, Schindler invested money setting up proper kitchens and dining areas for his workers in his factories, as well as a small doctor's clinic to see to their medical needs. Despite his work for and close ties to the Nazis, Schindler was seemingly never possessed of anti-Semitic feelings of any kind. He joined the Nazis despite their racial ideology, not because of it. This favorable treatment of his Jewish workers was probably tolerated by the Nazi authorities in Krakow because they viewed Schindler as a largely harmless figure. In this respect, his heavy drinking, carousing and womanizing behavior actually became beneficial during the war. Many Nazis, who might otherwise have scrutinized his conduct more closely, overlooked his activities. Indeed, on one occasion, when some members of the secret police, the Gestapo, called to Schindler's factory to question him about some of his workers, he appears to have gotten them drunk before sending them on their way a few hours later. Schindler's efforts to shelter Jewish workers would dramatically increase in scale from 1942 onwards. This was owing to a new development in the Nazi state's approach to the Jewish people within its borders. In the course of 1941, Hitler and his senior ministers had become increasingly confident that they would not have to answer for anything they did within their borders to any foreign power. By that time, they had conquered virtually all of Western Europe. Only Britain remained unbowed, and across the Atlantic Ocean, public opinion in the United States was against entry into the war, despite the personal desire to do so of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. In this environment, when an invasion of the Soviet Union was commenced with in the summer of 1941, SS death squads were sent in behind the army to massacre hundreds of thousands of Jews in Ukraine and other regions. Back within the borders of the Third Reich, a new strategy was decided upon. This was a policy of identifying and detaining all of the Jewish people and sending them to a number of death camps in Poland, such as Auschwitz-Birkenau, Treblinka, and Sobibor, where they would be gassed to death. The final solution, as it was termed, was decided on by the late summer of 1941 and was to be put into effect from the start of 1942. Schindler's experience of the Holocaust, which would follow from the final solution, was not through direct experience of the death camps, but rather through a smaller concentration camp called Krakow Płasow. Krakow Płasow was largely a labor camp and a holding center where large numbers of Jews from Krakow and other locations were interred for weeks or months before being sent by train to Auschwitz or one of the other death camps. Although originally a small detention center where just over a thousand prisoners were held, it was expanded in the course of 1942 and 1943 to hold in excess of 10,000 people at any given time and would hold nearly 20,000 prisoners at its peak. While they were kept here, people were effectively used as slave labor and here was where Schindler came into the equation. As the war dragged on, he found it increasingly difficult to find workers for his factories and the regime began offering him labor from Krakow Płasow. Schindler accepted and would spend the next few years trying to save as many people as he could. It was a constant struggle, in large part because Krakow Płasow was overseen by Amon Goat as commandant. An Austrian member of the Waffen-SS, Goat was a drunken sadist who often shot prisoners for little or no reason. 
It was this individual that Schindler would have to contend with during the years of the Holocaust. If there was a moment in Schindler's life when he moved from being a partial member of the Nazi regime who treated his workers slightly better than most others to being somebody who was committed to saving the lives of the Jews who worked for him, then it surely occurred in the months between the summer of 1942 and the spring of 1943, as the Krakow Ghetto was liquidated. The Krakow Ghetto was much smaller than its equivalent in Warsaw, but it nevertheless had housed over 15,000 Jews at its height in 1941. Early in 1942, following the initiation of the Final Solution, orders had been sent into Poland for the liquidation of the ghettos in the months to come. That summer, the sinister process of forcibly removing thousands of Jews from the ghettos and sending them on trains to the concentration camps began. In Krakow, this was overseen from the end of May by SS Oberführer Julian Scherner. Most of it was completed within the space of a few weeks, after which only a few thousand Jews were left here as laborers. The final liquidation of the ghetto, consequently, did not occur until March 1943. It was carried out under the command of Amon Goth. During this time, several thousand of those who were left here were sent to Krakow Poisov, but upwards of 2,000 Jews who were deemed unfit for work were killed in the streets of the ghetto. Schindler witnessed these events and was appalled. From that point onwards, his sole objective in Poland was to protect the lives of as many Jews as possible. In the months that followed, Schindler began using his privileged status as a supplier of goods to the German army to undertake his work of saving those who would later become known as Schindler Jude or Schindler Jews. Because his factories were deemed necessary for the war effort, he was able to continue hiring Jews from Krakow Poisov even after the final solution was commenced with, and to have them brought to his factories, removing the danger of either being sent to the death camps or falling mercy to Amangod's sadistic urges. The commandant of the camp was known to wander about Krakow Poisov, drunk, shooting Jewish detainees on the merest pretext so any Jew who was sent to Schindler's factories to work was removed from the danger of possible sudden death. When these workers were threatened with being sent to Auschwitz as the Holocaust intensified, Schindler would often falsify paperwork in order to make it seem that they were an essential part of his operations. For instance, housewives and lawyers were certified by Oscar as having invaluable skills as metal workers or mechanics. When others became sick or incapacitated so that they could not work, he did his best to disguise this fact as well, as a revelation of illness and an inability to work meant almost certain death for any Jew in wartime Poland. These actions created great personal danger for Schindler. Between 1942 and 1944, he was arrested and questioned by the Gestapo on several occasions on charges of irregularities in the paperwork he was filing and of showing excessive favor to his Jewish workers. Despite this, Oscar did not desist. He even undertook a highly risky trip to the Hungarian capital Budapest in 1943 to meet two senior members of the huge 750,000-strong Hungarian Jewish community. There, he provided them with extensive details about what was occurring in Poland information which no doubt helped to save many lives when the Nazis took over direct control of Hungary in the spring of 1944 and extended the Holocaust into the country. Schindler visited Budapest on several occasions and brought back money to help finance the Jewish resistance movement within Poland. Ironically, his earlier activities with the Abwehr in the 1930s had acted as a kind of training for his later work, supporting the Jewish underground in Central Europe. As well as endangering himself, Schindler's activities by 1943 were also impoverishing him once again. The extensive contracts which Schindler had acquired in 1940 to supply the German army with enamelware had briefly made him a rich man in the early 1940s, particularly once the German invasion of the Soviet Union was entered into in 1941, and millions of German soldiers and auxiliary staff needed to be supplied with his goods. However, from 1942 onwards, 
Schindler began spending huge amounts of money on obtaining foodstuffs and other supplies such as medicines for the Jews who worked in his factories. The Nazi regime itself provided only a tiny amount of food for each Jewish laborer. Schindler made up the deficit. This was no mean task for a man who, at the height of his operations in 1942 and 1943, was employing over 1,500 Jewish workers in his factories in and around Krakow. Furthermore, the scale of the goods which he was obtaining could not be brought in without attracting attention, and Schindler also had to spend considerable amounts of money on bribes. He would later state that he spent a sum in excess of $1 million on these activities. This would equate to upwards of $20 million in today's money. By the time the war ended in 1945, Schindler was as broke as he had been when it started. Schindler's efforts to shield hundreds of Jewish people from the Polish camps would ultimately have been in vain if the war had continued to go in Germany's favor. Had it done so, eventually nearly all of Europe's Jews would have been killed. However, that was not the case. Initially, the war had proceeded extremely well for the Nazis, with Poland being conquered swiftly in the autumn of 1939, followed by quick invasions and occupations of Denmark and Norway in the spring of 1940. That summer, a remarkably swift campaign westwards had resulted in the Low Countries and France being brought under Nazi rule. Britain, though, was another matter. Its navy and its position as an island ensured it was the one state in Europe other than the Soviet Union which could resist Nazi aggression. Thus, after a brief bombing campaign and efforts to force the British to surrender in late 1940 and early 1941, Hitler turned his attentions eastwards towards the Soviet Union, initiating an enormous land invasion of Ukraine, eastern Poland, and the Baltic states in the summer of 1941. At first, this met with major success, and the German armies were nearing Leningrad and Moscow by the autumn. But then, as the Russians began to pump enormous manpower into their war machine, the German advance stalled. The winter of 1941 was significant in more ways than one. That December, the United States also ended the war and a new alliance of Britain, the US, and the Soviet Union now emerged. As a consequence, 1942 saw the gradual turning of the tide, as the German and Italian campaign was stymied in North Africa, and then the Russians won a major victory over the Germans at the Battle of Stalingrad in southwestern Russia. The following year, the Allies went on the offensive, with the Russians beginning to push the Germans back eastwards and the Western Allies initiating an invasion of southern Italy that summer after the victorious conclusion of the North Africa campaign came earlier that year. By that time, it was clear that the war would end in German defeat, barring the development of a weapon such as a nuclear bomb by the Germans or a major falling out amongst the Allies. Neither of these eventualities came close to occurring, and in the summer of 1944, a new Western Front was opened by the US and Britain in France. Paris and other key cities in Western Europe, such as the port of Antwerp, were soon liberated by the Allies. The Third Reich's days were now numbered, and with it the possibility increased that the Russian advance would reach into Poland before the many Jews whom Schindler was protecting were ultimately killed by the Nazi regime. As the Russians advanced westwards into Ukraine and Poland in the summer and autumn of 1944, the Nazis began the process of evacuating much of eastern and central Poland and dismantling the concentration camps there. Ultimately, krakow Warsaw concentration camp would not be liberated until January 1945, but by the summer of 1944, plans were underway to remove the factories from the area. Schindler was in danger of having his right to retain Jewish labor for his businesses removed altogether, as in the desperate military situation which the Nazi state found itself in by this time, enamelware was no longer considered vital to the war cause. He was advised by Mitek Pemper, a secretary of Amangots, who was himself a Polish Jew, to consider switching his business to begin making anti-tank weapons in order to be allowed to continue to shield his Jewish workers. But instead, Schindler used his contacts, his powers of persuasion, and a healthy amount of bribes 
to convince Goethe and many other officials in the general government, many of whom were immensely corrupt, to allow him to move his factory operations to Brünnlitz in his native Czech region and to allow him to move hundreds of his workers from Poland in the process. This was duly sanctioned in the early autumn of 1944. The move from Krakow to Brunlitz occasioned the development of Schindler's famed List, a roll of names of approximately 1,200 Jews who were to be sent to Brunlitz to work at Schindler's new factories, and thus would be spared the fate of most of those at the krakow poissov concentration camp, the great majority of whom were sent to Auschwitz and near certain death in the autumn and winter of 1944. The list was drawn up by Oscar. His wife Emily, who had joined him in Poland back in 1941, Pemper, and several others such as Abraham Bankier and Marcel Goldberg. On it were included the names of all of Schindler's workers at his factory in Krakow, and scores more from amongst those held at krakow Płasow. However, they very nearly all perished. When most of these Jews were deported from krakow Płasow in the late autumn of 1944, they were mistakenly sent on different trains to Großhausen concentration camp and Auschwitz. When he learned what had occurred, Schindler quickly managed to have the bulk of them who had been sent to Großhausen released. However, it was more difficult to secure the discharge of 300 female Jews who had been sent to Auschwitz. Schindler dispatched his secretary there, where they were only discharged when he agreed to pay a bribe of seven Reichsmarks for every worker. This is the only case that we know of where hundreds of Jews were allowed to leave Auschwitz alive to be sent somewhere other than another concentration camp. Once the Schindler Jude had been brought to Brünnlitz, the main task for Oscar and Emily was to ensure that they were not removed from there again before the war ended. Its conclusion was now looming nearer and nearer. The Western Allies crossed into Western Germany in the first weeks of 1945 and began a rapid advance into central and southern Germany in the spring. More significantly, the Soviets had begun their final drive into eastern Germany in January 1945, and by early April had surrounded Berlin, signaling the final stages of the war. Oscar and Emily Schindler continued their humanitarian efforts throughout this time. In January 1945, 120 Jewish prisoners were removed from Goletzow, a sub-camp of Auschwitz, to supply workers to Schindler's factory at Brünnlitz. These 120 men were sent westwards in a cattle wagon, with no heating in the depths of winter and without any food. When they arrived to Brünnlitz, 13 of them were dead, and another 107 were starving and frostbitten. Schindler refused to allow the Nazi commander in charge of the train to burn the bodies of the deceased, and instead had them buried with full Jewish rites near the Catholic cemetery. The 107 survivors were nursed back to health at Brünnlitz in the days and weeks that followed. The Second World War came to an end in the first days of the summer of 1945. Hitler killed himself in the Reich Chancellery bunker in Berlin on the 30th of April, and when his designated successor Joseph Goebbels did the same a day later, the other heads of the government began negotiating Germany's formal surrender even as the Russians closed on the center of Berlin. As an individual who had been high up in the Abwehr in the 1930s and who had profited extensively from the occupation of Poland from the autumn of 1939 onwards, Schindler might have now been facing arrest and trial like so many others involved in the regime. However, he had been supplied with several letters from some of the Jews who had been with him for extensive periods of time, which attested to his having saved their lives. He was also gifted a gold ring inscribed with the words, Whoever saves one life, saves the world entire, which had been fashioned using gold supplied by another Schindler Jude, Simon Yeret. With these, Oscar and Emily set off west as the war ended hoping to avoid falling into the hands of the Soviet authorities. This they successfully did, and by the autumn of 1945, they were settled in the US zone of occupation in Bavaria in southern Germany. There, their evidence was presented to the authorities. Schindler was not to be prosecuted. The end of the war left Schindler back where he had been before it started, broke. <laughs>
Though he had briefly become a millionaire in relative terms in Poland in the early 1940s, he had lost everything in paying bribes and acquiring black market goods to keep the hundreds of Jews at his factories alive in the final years of the war. He once again tried his hand at various business ventures in the post-war period. But in the highly unstable economic climate of post-war Germany, these did not prosper. Much of this was owing to his old habits. Schindler never quit his excessive drinking, and his health began to deteriorate from it as he entered his forties. Nevertheless, he was kept afloat during these years by many of the Jewish people whose lives he had saved. Many of these had left Europe to head to the nascent state of Israel in the Holy Land following the war, but they kept in touch with the Schindlers and often he would receive some financial support either from there or from those who remained in Europe. Despite this, he and Emily decided in the late 1940s to head for Argentina in South America, a country with a large ethnically German community and also one of the largest concentrations of the Jewish diaspora in the world. Here, they hoped to make a fresh start. In Argentina, Schindler learned that he was not a farmer. He tried his hand at raising chickens first and then diversified into otters for their fur. Oscar assured Emily they would soon be millionaires as the fur industry was booming. Trouble arose immediately though when Oscar soon realized that the otters he was raising were in fact nutrias, a similar looking creature, but effectively a species of South American rodent. Problems mounted and by the mid-1950s, Schindler was facing growing debts which he could not repay in Argentina. The Schindlers only survived thanks to the continuing generosity of those whom he had saved during the war and their relatives. However, Oscar and Emily's marriage did not last in Argentina. She was burned out from years of dealing with his drinking, laziness, failed business ventures and infidelities. She possibly considered it a blessing in 1957 when he effectively abandoned her and headed back to Germany. Back in Europe, Schindler struggled on. Business ventures came and went, and in 1963, he was forced to declare bankruptcy. An initiative to have a movie of his life made, one which would be directed by the acclaimed Austrian director Fritz Lang, fell through. Though true to form, Schindler quickly spent the advance he was given on the rights to his story. In 1964, he suffered a heart attack. It was the beginning of a period of ill health, which plagued him until his death in 1974 at 66 years of age. Perhaps somewhat unsurprisingly, he succumbed to liver failure in the end. Schindler has been rightly celebrated and memorialized since his death. Indeed, this had begun long before he died. The Schindler Jude or Schindler Jews, those Jews who effectively survived the Holocaust as a result of his actions, supported him in his troubles after the war. Most strikingly, in 1962, a carob tree was planted in recognition of Schindler's actions at Yad Vashem, the memorial site established to the victims of the Holocaust on the Mountain of Remembrance in Jerusalem. This was placed in the Garden of the Righteous among the nations. Four years later, he was granted the Order of Merit by the government of West Germany. And, as we have seen, there were plans during his own life, albeit abortive, to produce a motion picture detailing his actions in Poland during the Second World War. A film, as nearly all of us are aware, did eventually appear in the form of Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List in 1993, which won the Academy Award for the Best Motion Picture. That same year, Oscar and Emily Schindler were named Righteous Among the Nations, a title given to non-Jews or Gentiles who risked their lives during the Second World War to save the lives of Jewish people. He was one of the few active members of the Nazi party to have been accorded this honor. Oscar Schindler was an enigmatic character. If we were to examine his life up to the early 1940s, it doesn't read very well. By the time he was in his early 20s, he was developing a drinking problem and was arrested on numerous occasions for public disorder offenses. His marriage was troubled and he engaged in a string of affairs, one of which resulted in the birth of two children out of wedlock, neither of which he is reported to have looked after particularly well. Then, when the Nazis rose to power in Germany, he began acting as a spy for them in Czechoslovakia, undermining the sovereignty of his own country 
and helping to gather information in the late 1930s for the invasion of Poland. Although the details of his espionage activities are necessarily shadowy, there seems little doubt that he was one of the Nazi regime's most senior spies in Czechoslovakia in the mid to late 1930s. He then used his influence with the regime, following the invasion of Poland in the autumn of 1939, to acquire property in the occupied part of the country and set up his business interests there. Much of this was effectively asset stripping from a conquered people whose nation he had helped to gather intelligence on prior to the invasion. However, from the early 1940s onwards, the Oskar Schindler who is celebrated by the world emerged. As the Nazis' anti-Jewish policies became more and more severe in Poland, and he was confronted with the reality of what the regime was doing, a seed change occurred and Schindler began trying to shield his Jewish workers from the possibility of death rather than viewing them simply as a means to enrich himself. Such was Schindler's moral awakening that in the next few years he spent virtually every penny of the considerable fortune he had accumulated in his first years in Poland, trying to save as many Jews as possible from being killed at Amongod's concentration camp at Płaszow, or being deported to one of the death camps such as Auschwitz-Birkenau, Treblinka or Sobibor. As the Holocaust and the Second World War entered its last stages, Schindler was directly responsible for saving the lives of hundreds of Jews by insisting that they were needed to run his factory at Brunlitz. Otherwise, they would surely have been sent to their deaths. His life after the war was as chaotic as it was prior to the rise of the Nazis in the early 1930s. In a sense, this symmetry perhaps reflected in some way who Schindler was. A troubled man who was capable of doing great good and who left his mark on the world through the latter. What do you think of Oskar Schindler? Do his early dealings with the Nazis in some way tarnish his legacy? Or were they simply due to his naivety about what the Nazis were capable of? Please, let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.